Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're connecting from. I'm uh, super excited and uh, happy to be hosting you guys again to uh, today. So just uh, put in a comment and which part of the world you're actually connecting from. Would love to know where at least you are connecting from. And uh, you can put your comments below in the in the in the chat box there today. I mean, uh, welcome to everybody, and I'm super excited. And uh, you are willing also to take part uh, to take this journey with me. We're getting to get ready to dive into this question of faith and finances, and how do faith and finances go go together? What does one have to do with the other? Why does God care about my money anyway? And um, these are some of the questions maybe uh, we're going to be going through this event. I'm going to try to go as quickly as we can. So we'll cover the entire spectrum of finances and learn faithful methods of money management regardless of our financial uh, uh, status. So finances can have a profound impact on our faith. So no matter our situation, they can help us cultivate an attitude of generosity, uh, contentment, and also a radical trust in God. So discovering financial faith is about using the resources that we have in a way that honors and glorifies uh, God and helps us to grow in our relationship uh, with him. So let's get going and let's jumping into, into that as well. So my name is uh, Henry Moyo. I'm an entrepreneur and I've actually learned a lot. And um, in terms of uh, going through these uh, challenges, let's do first as well in the terms of finances and how it also helps you to see things in a completely uh, a, a different way. So we are offering these uh, services to everybody who can actually to make it a better way as well as well, because they say, uh, successful people learn from other people's uh, mistakes as well. So if you've got your own story with something that you want to share, make other people learn as well from what you've gone through as well. So let's get into this, what you're going to share for today. So for Christians, myself, I'm a Christian. So most of things is going to be based on the Christian point of view. So from uh, for Christians, a universal catch catchphrase i mean we hear is that uh jesus is our lord and um, and savior so sometimes you hear celebrities they go up on stage accepting maybe a word and the first thing they say is well i first want to thank my lord and savior jesus christ it is not maybe for us to judge their sincerity about that but the phrase may be too much part of our cultural medium for us to truly understand what it means so the bible does call jesus our savior and um who destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through gospel so if you read second timothy verse one in uh timothy second timothy one uh verse 10. so it seems that most people have no problem with jesus as savior god sent jesus to come and die in our place and have all our sins placed on him Yes, please. <laughs> However, the Bible also takes it a step further. In, in becoming our savior, uh, Jesus also became our Lord or master. So therefore, let the whole house of Israel know for certain that God has made his both Lord and Messiah, Jesus whom you crucified. That's on Acts 2 verse 36. So Jesus being the Lord means that he has control and sway over our lives. It means that we are submitted to his will for us. It means that we don't do anything without the approval of our master. It also means that Christ is Lord of our pocketbooks and our wallets. He has a say about how we spend, what we buy, what we don't buy, how we save, and how much we give. If Christ is our savior, then he's our Lord. If he's our Lord, then there's nothing in our lives outside the realm of his lordship. In what tangible ways is Jesus the Lord of your life? Can you think of any ways you have given Christ lordship over your finances? It might, in what might you uh, be holding back from giving a say in your, I mean, Jesus a say in your finances. So I want you guys to look at what you call maybe stewardship. So, I mean, if you look at the um, a dictionary, it defines stewardship as a job supervising, um, a job of, uh, a job of supervising or taking care of something. But in a biblical definition of stewardship could be managing God's blessings, God's ways um, for God's glory. So according to this definition, all our resources, assets, and bank accounts are God's. 
God is the owner. We are simply the managers. This idea has, has great potential to change the way, I mean, we view our possessions. Nothing that we have is ours. It's, it's like a loan. And God expects us to manage it in a way that reflects his uh, person and values. Everyone was born with nothing and you're going to leave this world with nothing. So you shall not violate the rights of the alien or the orphan, not take the clothing of a widow as a pledge. Deuteronomy uh, 24 verse 17, if you read that. So cursed be he who violates the rights of the alien, the orphan or the widow, and all the people shall answer amen. Deuteronomy again, 27 verse 19. So if I'm to read Psalms 9 verse 19, also it says, it is he who judges the world with justice, who judges the people with fairness. And uh, if I'm to look, read again for you, Isaiah verse 1, um, 11, it says, what care, what care, what care I for the number of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough for the world burned realms of fat, of fatlings in the blood of calves, lambs and goats, I find no pleasure. Wash yourselves clean. Put away your misdeeds from before my eyes. Cease doing evil. Learn to do good. Make justice your aim. Redress the wrong. Hear the offense plea. Defend the widow. So there are many examples in the Old and New Testaments of God admonishing us to take care of each other, especially those less fortunate. So if we are to align our finances and our resources with God's values, then this must include finding ways to use our resources to help others. So what ways uh, can you think to see your resources in this way as well? So I think most of us have heard this term money it isn't money the root of all evil. Money is the root of all evil. This is a common misconception that money is evil or that the Bible says money is the root of all evil. This is not what the Bible says. The text actually says, for the love of money is the root of all evils. And some people in their desire for it have strayed from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. So 1 Timothy verse 6, verse 10. So St. Paul does not say here that money is the root of all evil. He says the love of money is the root of all evils. And then qualifies the statement by pointing that because of the pursuit of money, people have strayed from the faith and have made their lives more difficult. So the text, um, uh, this text then is not a criticism of having money but a warning against being overly attached to money. How many wars have been fought over greedy money and power? These are the biggest problems that we have in the world right now. How many conflicts have we personally been that revolve around money? Having an exaggerated attachment to money can indeed lead to many problems. We are called to hold money in its proper perspective. It is the means to an end and not an end in itself. If we maintain the view that stewardship is our management of God's resources, then money is not our end goal. Instead, it is a means for us to glorify God and accomplish his purpose. How has the love of money has led to trouble in the world or in your life? How can you hold money in a more balanced uh, perspective? So we need to be trusting God in our finances. So most of us have been in situations in our lives where finances have been little tight. You know, I mean, everyone has gone through all those situations where finances are a bit tight for you. And even if, even if um, it was not a hand to mouth situation, most of us have felt the need for more at one point in our, or another. It could be that uh, maybe a car breaking down unexpectedly, losing your job, or certain things happening as well, just like myself. Uh, I've got a, a broken tooth now, I've got an appointment, I have to go and see a specialist and the quotation that I'm getting is just something else. So anything can just happening before, you know, life does not wait for us to have everything in order for it to decide to happen, life happens. So it is precisely a uh, time like this that we, uh, that calls us to a higher level in trust in God. Uh, Jesus said, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which grows today, is, and is thrown into the oven tomorrow, will he not much more provide you or you little of faith? So do not worry and say, 
what are we to eat or what are we to drink or what are we to wear? Matthew 6, verse 30 to 31. Jesus calls us to trust God no matter our circumstances. He called us not to worry about material things, but to seek, uh, but to seek, to seek his kingdom uh, uh, first and his righteousness. And these things will be given, uh, will be given to you. So have I've seen uh, firsthand how God continues to provide and take care of us when our finances are tight. So there have been times when <laughs> there was no money in my account and but never went hungry or lacked but we, uh, uh, anything that we needed. As the Bible says, that one shall dwell on the heights with fortress of rock, stronghold food and drink in steady supply. Isaiah 33 verse 16. Think about a time in your life when finances were tight. How did you respond to these circumstances? And how did your faith play a role in those situations? Everyone goes through those moments. Don't think it's only you. So there are some Christian traditions where like um, many people ask, what is tithing? What is it all about? So tithing is mandatory and practiced regularly. So there are other traditions where it is not mandatory, but highly encouraged in others where it is not even practiced at all. What is tithing anyway? And how does it impact understanding faith and finances? So tithe means a tenth. So it is mentioned in the Bible in uh, Genesis 14. And then when in, in Genesis uh, 28, referring to Abraham and Jacob offering God a tenth of their income. It is, a, it is also commanded in the Mosaic law in Fyridale Leviticus. So the question is whether Christians are still commanded to give 10% of their income today. Christians are still divided on this issue. Some say yes, and some say no. And um, so there's no command in the New Testament to, to, to tithe. However, there are numerous commands in the New Testament to be generous and help each other when needed. Each must do, um, each must do as already determined without sadness or compul compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. That's on Corinthians. And, uh, and they would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's needs. That's X. If you read on X 2 verse 45, it is someone who has worldly means, sees a brother in need and refuses him compassion. How can the love of God remain in him? First John verse 3 verse 17. So we can go on. There's so many we can quote here. So the main issue for Christians is that we maintain a spirit of generosity and give according to our conscience. We are not commanded to give maybe 10%, but we should give according to what the Holy Spirit moves us to give. That giving can be to your local church, a mission group, or a church of center, or to anyone you see in need. Have you practiced that thing or regularly giving? Do you uh, currently, if so, what has been your experience? That's what to me really matters. So when you look at also treasures in heaven, do not store up yourself for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and decay destroy and thieves break in and steal, but store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor decay destroys nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, they, they also... Uh, will your heart be? That's Matthew 6, verse uh, 19. So this thing gets to, to issue of our priorities. God does not hate money. Money is not evil. And there's nothing wrong with having money. However, Jesus' choice of the word treasure here is revealing. It suggests something that we cherish, something for which we would give everything. So Jesus' point seems to be that money and material things in general should not be our treasure. What drives us above Everything else should be our connection with God. So I know a lot of people whose number one priority in life is making money. At some point, the money will dry up or your, your means of making money will change or disappear. There has to be something deeper driving us. So what is your why of doing what you're doing? So our, our true treasure should be in heaven. Take stock of the priorities and goals in your life. Do they revolve around things and materials of something deeper. So sometimes, uh, can you serve two masters? No one can serve two masters. You will either hate one and love another. So, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
Matthew 6, verse 24. This passage again refers to our priorities as it relates to money. Mammon was the word that meant wealth. Although it is sometimes uh, personified as that, um, who we are going to allow to be our master, God or money. If we generally release the idea of money being our master, it frees us up to use our money for God's purposes. So it frees up for greater generosity. It frees us up for charity and directly help uh, those in need. It frees us to be a blessing. So I believe this is why Jesus uh, helps so much on this point. He is our master and the one that provides for all our needs, we must never uh, forget. So when you look at this as well, uh, I mean, you need also to cultivate uh, generosity new. What want, uh, we want to know, brothers, of the grace of God that has been given to the churches of Macedonia for in a severe test of uh, affliction, the abundance of their joy and their profound pro uh, poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Uh, that's Corinthians uh, 8, verse 1 to 2. It is not that I'm eager for the gift, rather I'm eager for the profit that accrues to your account. Philippians 4, verse 17. How can we cultivate a spirit of generosity in our lives so that we are going to and doing our best to helping anyone that we can. So, you know, what a study done by psychologists uh, shows that um, there are many five um, areas that people can be of, your, uh, of generous uh, people. You know, you find that uh, the volunteer, voluntary financial giving, there's volunteering your time and emotional generosity, going and helping out other people as well. Generosity towards those you live and work with and generosity as a personal uh, value. So the first step to developing these activities and habits in our lives is to submit to Christ's uh, Lordship. It is our Lord. We must realign our priorities to his priorities. Secondly, we must acquire the proper biblical perspective of money. It is a means to an end, serving God and others and not an end in itself. We also come to realize that God has blessed us uh, to bless others. When we do these things, our hearts will be transformed. Finally, we must trust that God will take care of our needs as we endeavor to, he to help take care of others. Have you ever known a super generous person? What is it like to be around them? Share maybe in the comments below there and also be a, a cheerful giver. It must be, it must do as already determined without sadness, or a compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. So be able to donate your time, save your time as well. So do whatever you can to, to, to help other people as well. And one thing I want also to look at as well is contentment. Many people were not content with what we have and what we do as well. So this makes us to do certain things that at least we are not, uh, because we are not happy or not content uh, with what uh, uh, we have. So St. Paul uh, learned to be content, whether he was hungry or full, whether he had uh, a lot or had nothing. The secrets to this way of living are radical, complete trusting in God and gratitude. It is trusting in God's plan, his word and his presence. It is also practicing being grateful for what you have instead of focusing what you don't have. Another way as well is uh, dealing with uh, 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 debt. Many people have also um, have a challenge as well on how to deal with their, their debt as well. So debt is not fun. It's not the end of our financial faith journey. In fact, it can be the beginning. Getting out of debt can free to live a life full of generosity and fulfillment. The best strategies I have been seen for eliminating debt start with a plan. So many people, there are so many different plans. And uh, if you are serious in debt, find somebody else who can help you. But many people, the strategies that I've seen working is, you know what, get all your debts in place, calculate your minimum uh, uh, payments for all your debts and make a plan. Some people, what they do is they start off with the minimum debt that you have and you start paying that one off or they start with the debt that you can quickly pay off. Then whatever you 
you were paying on that, you'd add it on to the other, to the second debt that you can quickly pay off. The reason for doing that is to change your mind. When you start seeing winning, it changes you, it motivates you to say, hey, I've cleared one. So if you don't win, you keep on remaining in that uh, in that cycle as well. So, so that's what you can put in to get rid of your debt as well. So start with the smallest debt, get it rid of it, put up the money into the next debt. Once you get rid of it, put to the next debt. Once you get rid of it, put to the fourth debt. So that's a snowball effect. So imagine your third debt is you're paying all the payments you're paying in your first and second debt that you've cleared off. So that's a snowball effect that at least you can use to clear off uh, that debt as well. Now, um, so, so blessed to be a blessing. So I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the all the communities of the earth shall be a blessing in you. That's Genesis 12, verse 3. What is the purpose of the money that we have? Survival is one. We need shelter, food, clothing. We don't necessarily need abundance, but just enough to be comfortable. Legacy is another. People want something to leave to their children, grandchildren. However, I have to conclude from scripture that God has not provided us with money and resources so we can survive, be comfortable and live a lasting legacy. There is um, a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches kept by their owner uh, to his head. Should the riches be lost through some misfortune, he may have a son when he is without means as he can uh, forth from his mother's womb, so again shall depart, naked as he came, having nothing from labor that he can carry in his hand. So King Solomon has said, there is no matter how much we amass, we will all live this earth the same way we came, with nothing. So what can, what then is the purpose of money? So uh, God tells Abraham that he will bless him he is blessing him so that he will be a blessing to others. If God has blessed us financially or in any other way, we should consider how we can use what we have been given to bless others. How can we bless others? Charity work or donations, giving time to local church or outreach organization, helping someone in time of need. This by no means is, a, is, is not exhaustive. There are so many things, many people now you can do with your resources that God has given you. So if you are take, if you are talking about finances, then we must also have a conversation about budgeting. God wants us to be good stewards of resources he has given us and uh, budgeting is a great way to do that. Most of us are familiar with how to build a budget. So we, so I will not go over it. We just be aware of uh, that creating a budget can help you build faith. So budgeting helps us to manage our resources in a way that honors and glorifies God. For example, a faith-based budget should maybe include giving. So have part of giving as well, part of get some uh, financial work, charity work as well, set aside for those things in your, in your budget as well. I want you to understand, God wants you to live an abundant life, but at the same time, be resourceful with the resources that it is God has given you. And... Um, so the one thing I just want to also talk about is how much should we save? We cannot have a conversation about finances without talking about uh, our savings. So I used to be told, give 10% to God and then give 10% to yourself or referring to your savings. This is something that many people struggle with. Truly, you know, if you look at many people are living from paycheck to paycheck and saving is not an option right now for so many people. But one thing I want to tell you is, uh, if we look at budgeting, planning and managing, and also eliminating your debt, uh, we can free to serve God in the way he wants us to. So savings are part of that freedom. So savings is not a selfishly um, to hold wealth for a rainy day. It is about being prepared for emergencies, having a plan for your goals and making sure your, you and your family are taken care of when it's time to stop working. A good saving plan will I mean, set you, um, will set you up uh, to be able to fulfill God's priorities in your finances, managing your resources and helping others. So if you haven't started saving, how do you get started? First, open a savings account. If you can find one with good interest, that's even better for you. But one thing I can tell you is just start saving, whether it's $10, $100, 
whatever you can just put into that account and just have a habit of saying every month I'm paying, consider it as, as just the way you pay your other bills, considering it as a bill that you have to pay on a monthly basis. You have to pay it without fail. If you don't pay into that savings account, you're getting summons for you to say, hang on, what has happened? We're demanding this money from you. So just start saving. And I'm telling you, as you get into the habit, you start increasing that amount to certain levels as well. So family and, and finances often um, don't get together very well. So perhaps you maybe have dealt with a relative that is always asking for a handout and is <laughs> and is always in need. This has happened to so many people. Or maybe you are in a business with a family member. These types of situations are, are never easy. How, how does this type of scenario fit in with our objective of glorifying God with our finances? First, as we have mentioned, it is imperative to cultivate a spirit of generosity. There is nothing wrong with being generous and giving someone in need, especially if it's a family member. It can get complicated. However, if say the family member is taking advantage of a generosity and failing to take personal responsibility, you don't want to enable members in uh, family members in their financial situation, or do you want them to turn them away altogether? I believe the proper generous response is to help where you can, but also hold family members accountable. There are many ways accountability could look. It could be setting a payback plan, or if you want to forgive the debt altogether, helping to plan how to avoid borrowing in the future. So, of course, if uh, life happens to everyone, expected expenses and issues arise all the time. At the end of the day, uh, assess the situation and pray for God's guidance. Have you ever had an uncomfortable situation with a family member? I mean, we all face that. So you are there to help them as well. So one thing, um, it says uh, the, the sin of uh, envy. This is something that really affects so many people. You should not envy your neighbor's house. You should not envy your neighbor's wife, uh, his male or his female slave, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Exodus 20, verse 17. Uh, you know, being uh, covetous is a deadly sin. How many crimes would you say have been committed because someone wanted what someone else had? I would guess a whole lot. So envy goes to the core of our being. They speak to our inability to be satisfied with what we have. They speak to our lack of contentment and peace. So to be covetous of another person's possession or life is to say to God, you haven't done enough for me. Can't I have what they have? The problem with uh, this is that it is an illusion. It is the grass is greener on the, on the other side syndrome. The reality is that the thing that you think will bring you happiness likely won't. There's always something else um, to be had. There's always something else to acquire. There's always another goal to achieve. There's always more money to make. You will never find satisfaction until you can appreciate what you have. If you, if you struggle with this, share your experiences as well. So, but store up your true, uh, store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor decay or no thieves or break and steal. For where your treasures is, there will be your heartbeat. That's Matthew 6, I've mentioned this as well. So you need to start building on your true uh, treasures as well. So just wanna thank you for being on this call and, um, and uh, having you on this on this journey uh, right now and sharing this with you guys. I hope this has been of much uh, great help as well, having your financial faith and uh, it's gonna help you to, to do the, the best thing that at least you can do and also help your money in a, in a biblical way and having your faith in what you're doing and growing your, 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 your business as well. So what I've just said with you, everybody goes faces some of those challenges. Some of the people that at least, it depends where you are right now with your on your faith journey and also in your financial world as well, where you are. Many people talk to some of these people who are successful, some talk to some of these people. They have gone through some of these things that I've mentioned here. They now... Um, have 
lived some of these uh, uh, things as well. So they can help you, guide you if you're somebody who's really struggling on this. Thank you so much for being on the call. I truly appreciate you. God bless you. Have a great day. Let's meet again next week. If you've got any topic or any area that you want me to cover for you, let me know and we'll definitely do that for you. Thank you so much for being on the call. We truly appreciate you.